Hi, everybody. Welcome to week seven of our English 3085 online course. I'm hoping that everyone is enjoying the extra couple of days to finish up your threshold concepts case study. I'm excited to look at those as they come in by Tuesday tomorrow. For now, though, I wanted to go ahead and dive into both the week's assignments and the mini lecture that covers this week's readings, because this week we are doing another turn within composition and rhetoric. And this week's is kind of a big one because as you'll see from the readings, it's one that hasn't ever gone away. It's one that we're still maintaining and reiterating. So that's kind of cool in terms of where we are in, in our overview of ret comp history because we're at a point where uh, the turn is more recent and its effects are consistently being felt even in scholarship today. So excited to talk about that with you guys. First, I'm gonna head over to our Canvas view and look at our week's assignments. Okay, so you can see here the week seven plan is to look at the turn within rhetoric and composition to what is called critical pedagogy. Um, and we've got three readings. Again, just a representative sample. Critical pedagogy is a theoretical horizon that when we crossed it in rec comp, we really just haven't ever looked back. So this is an area of study that has generated hundreds and hundreds of articles. I've only picked three examples, mainly because I'm trying to trace for you guys the arc from its sort of the beginning of the turn until more pr recently, present day. Um, in terms of our schedule, though, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we're talking about all of this stuff. You're going to watch your week seven instructor video, which you're already doing. High five. We've got our three readings and a reading discussion. So in terms of our workload, hopefully it should be a cozy one. Lots of reading, one reading discussion, just a quick reminder, make sure you're participating in that reading discussion early enough so that you're actually discussing and having a back and forth with your classmates. It is very frustrating, both I know from like a participant's point of view and from a teacher's point of view, when stuff doesn't get posted until like nine o'clock on Sunday night. Now I get it, sometimes life is busy, but you don't get to have that back and forth and some folks don't get to respond to you at all. So try to make sure that you're getting into that reading discussion early enough so that by Sunday, you're finishing it, not starting it. You know what I mean? Okay. So from here, I'm just going to head right over to the PowerPoint and talk through a quick mini lecture about these readings and kind of give us a little bit of positionality for the turn to critical pedagogy. Okay, so this week we are talking about the turn within rhetoric and composition toward critical pedagogy. Now, this is a turn that is largely traced back to a scholar named Paolo Freire, or Freire, I'm not sure how to pronounce it honestly. I've heard it pronounced both ways, Freire or Freire. Um, he is a South American scholar who initially published his work in Spanish and was only available to us through the translations and iterations of another scholar from New York named Ira Shore. But in 1984, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed was published in English, and so we were able to read Friera, that's what I'm going with, for ourselves in English unless we already knew Spanish and could read him in the original. Um, but here we are introduced to many of the foundational concepts of critical pedagogy. Namely, the first is that there is an alternative to what Freire calls the banking model of education, or sometimes this is referred to as the sage on the stage. In the banking model, Freire describes a system in which students are the receivers, the receptacles, and they are empty. And 
It is the teacher's job to deposit into the students' brains the knowledge, which of course the teacher has and the students have none of. Now, there are lots of reasons why this is problematic and Freira ties it directly to systems of oppression. Students are to be seen, not heard. This is the, the idea is shut up and let me teach you, right? Let me tell you everything I know and then you will know it too. Unfortunately, this system of teaching is perpetuated throughout education in the United States even today, which is quite frustrating to me as a teacher myself. But Freira here is illustrating it as a potential subject for critique for maybe the first time that United States teachers are realizing that there could be an alternative to this method of teaching. Um, that might be oversimplifying it a little bit, but hey, this is a 20,000 foot overview. Freira is gonna juxtapose this banking model with what he calls praxis, a combination of theory and practice in which the main purpose is to have students develop their own questions. This Freira sees as directly tied to fostering freedom and help. his main goal is to help students, he hopes, be able to identify their oppressors and the systems that are oppressing them so that they can question them and hopefully ultimately dismantle them. So praxis is enacted. You get students to pose their own questions by posing problems to them. Problem posing is this the whole basis for this, which of course gets complicated and gets critiqued itself in several, you know, iterations of scholarship that come after this. But Freira says that the problem posing dialogic relationship of teacher and student, not as sage on the stage and students who are empty vessels down here, but a back and forth dialogue between two relatively equal human beings. I mean, there's also been critiques about how a teacher can never fully divest themselves of the power dynamic that is inherent in their role, but that's another rabbit trail. This idea that we should have an equal dialogue is what fosters freedom. It's what helps students to develop their own questions, Freira argues. Now, Freira also is very contextually bound in his arguments because he's working in South America. He's very wary of revolutions that have only replaced one hegemony with another, right? Oh, here's the revolution. We're going to whip everybody up into a frenzy. We're going to overthrow the government, but we're going to enact our own form of oppression. So he's very wary of the word revolution or the idea that we could simply be trading bad for bad here. However, he's going to highlight the dialogic relationship when he gets to the example of his Chilean student who starts to sort of ask their own questions. And he's drawing parallels between his student and Jean-Paul Sartre, who's the famous French philosopher, of course, making the point that First of all, students are not empty vessels. Students come to the classroom full of ideas and experiences and knowledge that they bring with them. And that if you can foster this kind of question asking, you are highlighting that any dichotomy between student and teacher or scholar and student is a false dichotomy. So it's the beginning of it all. It's 1984 we keep going, right? So Jacqueline Royster, some of you may have read this if you've taken me for other classes. I really love this piece because she's talking from her own experience. She gives us three scenes from her own, she calls it her testimony or her own subject position. Um, so she's writing as a scholar, an African-American scholar in the field of rhetoric and composition, mainly in rhetoric and the history of rhetoric. Um, but if you're if you're interested in or if you know of Bell Hooks, who is a very famous African-American scholar, she 
there's cross references here like crazy as Royster describes some of her own experiences as a black scholar. Hooks talks about them at length in her short um, chapter called Keeping Close to Home, Class and Education. So if you're interested in a little cross-referencing, that's a good one to look up. But I love how Royster uses the term singular and plural here, where she talks about how her experiences from her subject position are singular. They're only her own. But she says, I had an idea that they might also be plural. That there might also be some universality here. Um, and then she demonstrates that there are directions for transformation. Or I love that she goes from there, from projecting where we might go to straight up call for action within specifically the discourse community of rhetoric and composition. So this is happening in 1996. So we're like a full decade after Freira, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Ira Shore, people waking up to the idea that there could be ways to teach that could not just be neutral, but actively anti-oppression. And then a decade later, we're seeing that, yeah, that's still needed, actually. And then it's still needed. <laughs> we get to Villanueva in 2011. So now we're like two decades beyond Royster, three decades beyond Freira. And now we have Villanueva, who is a dynamite scholar. I just think everything he writes is incredibly smart and powerful. Um, but he's going to take us through a rhetorical historical review of several scholars. And I wanted you guys to read this piece, especially at this point in the semester, because he's going to name drop like crazy. And I want you to see what are the names you recognize. And also, I want you to see what are the terms you recognize from previous turns. And also, what are the names and terms you don't yet recognize? Because that can help you as you're thinking about ways to fill in and revise your timeline and your field map. There could be a lot of rich areas for you to pull from and even do some little bit independent searching and reading in this piece. So utilize that. The cool thing about this piece is Villanueva is demonstrating for us both the arc of critical pedagogy as it has traced out and highlighting the systemic racism that is embedded even still 30 years after Fiera's Pedagogy of the Press was published in English. So <laughs> some hope, some progress, but still lots of oppression yet to be critiqued and questioned and dismantled. And oh, that's a little exhausting to think about, but also should galvanize us to continue on the work that the initial publications in critical ped pedagogy started it is still continuing, even though it's been decades and decades. So I'll leave you right there. I'm going to close out this video. Hope you guys have a great rest of your week, and I will see you in next week's video. Bye, everybody.